All right, I, I believe we are live. Yes, YouTube says I am live, so I'm going to believe YouTube in this case. So, um, hello everybody, let's delete all this as we begin yet again. Uh, so, welcome to yet another... I guess, I guess we are calling these hearing class lives, uh, so I'm just going to do some live patching. I usually do these live streams if I'm actually working on a project myself. And I'm dealing with something that has to do with uh, well, ambient music and also some visuals that have to do with ambient music. So I figured I'd just uh, go over the basics here and live stream it while I'm at it so it might be useful to uh, more than one person. In that case, that one person is me, of course. So, uh, just to jump straight into it, uh, I want to do two things in this live stream, right? So I want to create a ambient music generator. Uh, so some kind of algorithm and a system that generates ambient music, whatever that is. And I also want to generate ambient particles. I, I, I think that's what I put uh, on the thumbnail of the videos, ambient particles generator, question mark, question mark, question mark, because even I'm not sure what I'm going to do with this ambient particles generator. I'm going to improvise as I go along. I, I do have an idea for the ambient music generator. And I do know that I want there to be a connection between these two. So I want the data from the ambient music generator, again, whatever data this is, to feed into the ambient particles generator. And I will start with the ambient music part of this, right? Because I, I like music, I'm a musician, so by proxy, uh, as you might know, Almost all musicians love music. Not not all, but a lot of them do like music, and I'm one of those, so I'm going to create an easy deck object. Uh, and knowing that I am live streaming, I'm going to use a peak limiter this time. Right, so omx.peaklim is going to make sure whatever is coming in uh, does not have an amplitude above one. So if I accidentally blow out my speakers, your speakers will probably be safe. And I'm also going to create live.gain so I can control the gain of the audio. This makes it a bit larger. Okay, so this will be my audio output. Now, the thing is, what do I mean by ambient music, right? Uh, do I mean Brian Eno? Do I mean field recordings? Do I mean just uh, John Cage style, really slow music that goes on for decades and decades? Well, yes and no. I'm going to keep it simple. And that is one of the first things I need to do, right? If I write the steps, I need to uh, determine the aesthetic. I need to determine what kind of sounds I'm looking for. And as a last step, I have to, as always, play the sounds, which is pretty important because otherwise you don't have music. You just have a bunch of data. And in the middle, I have to generate, uh, I don't know, notes and chords and let's, let's call it bass. I need to generate some kind of bass maybe. And these are very broadly put the three steps of what I want to do. And if I'm thinking of ambient music, the aesthetic of ambient music, right? If I'm thinking of Brian Eno, uh, I'm thinking uh, slow music. So I can write these down. I can say slow music, a lot of reverb, uh, relatively simple. So it's kind of music that's, let's say, let, let's make it F major. I, I like F major. F, ma F major is a nice key. It gives me a warm, tingly feeling. So just an F major, really slow, really re reverby. Uh, and it's also relatively simple, not only in terms of harmony, right? It's also, there are notes and chords and bass, and that's it. We are not going to generate super complicated polyrhythms and... Uh, drum breaks, even though that would be really cool, and you should absolutely do that after uh, watching this video. I, I will keep it pretty easy. Okay, so that's what I want to do. So I have, I guess, determined the aesthetic, that I want something slow and reverby and relatively simple. So I guess I can add another optional, well, non-optional step and see if this uh, will make any sense. So I need to keep the time. Right? If, if this is slow, if the music I'm going to make is slow, I need to know how fast the music is. And then on, based on that speed, so let's say every measure or four times a measure or three times a measure or every 20 measures, I will generate these things and then I will play them. 
So let's begin from the end this time. I, when I do these videos, I always follow this list I made because I'm a very literal person. If I make a list, I will follow it. But let's let's start with the last one. Let's play the sounds. I already have a setup here for the sounds. And I can turn down the gain here if I want. Um, and I am going to use phasers. I'm going to use sawtooth waves, right? And if I create a phaser, and let's give it a low A note for one, so that's a frequency of 110, you will hear a not so fun phaser sound. If I turn this up, so yeah, I, I hope you can hear this. It's a live stream, so I'm not sure if I have control over all of the uh, live stream settings since I'm not an expert at that. But okay, so this is a sawtooth wave. It doesn't sound so fun. It doesn't sound so interesting, but maybe we can do something with it. So I'm first going to change the actual frequency. Let's use a K slider and let's look at the output from the first inlet, right? This is going to be the MIDI of uh, the MIDI value of the notes. Let's go with this low F. In fact, let's go with a lower F. So 41 minus 12 is 29. Yes, I, I believe, no, it's not 20. Yes, it is 29, right? So I can type this here. I can use the M to F object to turn the MIDI node into a frequency value, and I can feed this into the phaser. So if I type in 29, I get a very low F. In fact, it's so low, I don't like it. It's way too low. Let's, let's do 41 instead. Okay, that sounds like a low F note. It does sound a bit annoying. So why don't we use an envelope, right? Because that's eventually what I want to do. I want to be able to click a button or send a bang or send a message, and that would trigger the sound. I don't want this endless flurry of notes and uh, bass notes and chords and notes that don't ever stop. And that means I have to deal with an envelope, right? And I can be a sensible person and use the A, uh, D, S, R tilde object, so the A, D, S, R envelope generator. But I'm more of a function person, right? And if I create a function object, you'll see that this is a breakpoint function editor. If that doesn't mean anything to you, that's okay. If you lock this and if you start clicking in this box, you'll see what the object does. It lets you create breakpoints. It lets, it lets you define a function as a discrete points in time uh, with an x and a y domain. And this is a technique that's used, that is used very often to create envelopes. First of all, let me clear this by sending the object the message clear. And let me go into the inspector. Now, how this will work in this case is the x axis is going to determine the length of the sound, right? The length of the envelope. And here, the high domain display value, aka the x axis, is 1000. And we are going to think of these in milliseconds for reasons you're about to see. So this will be 100 milliseconds long. So the maximum length of my envelope will be 100 milliseconds. And the low and high display range, aka the y axis, aka up and down, will go from zero at the bottom to one at the top, which is perfect, which is exactly what I want. And you can see maybe why these are the default settings for this object, because zero would mean zero amplitude and one would mean normal amplitude. As in if I multiply an audio signal with one, I would get that exact audio signal if, uh, if my maths is not failing me. Okay, so uh, then all I have to do is draw something here, right? I can click to set points. And let's have an envelope like this. What is very important here is that the first and the last points always have to be zero. Right? Why? Because if it's going to start from something, it should start always from zero. Because uh, if it's something else here and suddenly it snaps to zero, we are going to hear a click. And at the very end, if we don't go to zero, but some other value, so if this final point is not at the bottom, it's just going to stay there. The amplitude is just going to stay at that level, which means we will hear a continuous sound and we won't really have the final step of, of the envelope when the sound goes away. But what do we do now? I mean, we have a cool envelope, which is nice, uh, but how do we actually integrate this into our phaser? 
Well, I think that's where the second outlet, yes, the second outlet of this object comes into play, all points in line format, which will make sense to you if you are familiar with the object line or its uh, cousin line tilde. Right, uh, so all of both of these objects are the same. If I go to the help file, I can see it generates ramps and line segments from one value to another within a specified amount of time. Well, I have multiple points here and I can go from one point to the other, right? And I'm going to use the line version because I want to print the result of that line. So the values I'm going to get from this line. If I use line tilde, I can't really visualize it in that way. Now I'm going to take the second outlet, the all points in line format outlet, and I'm going to connect it to my line. And now to trigger this envelope, all I have to do is, well, send a bank to the first inlet. And look at what happens. It starts from zero and it does this entire ramp in exactly one second. So I clean this, one second, and so over. And if I look at the values, I see that I'm starting at one and I'm very quickly going to uh, nine, uh, 0.913, then a bit more slowly I'm going to 0.6, uh, 672, which is this point, and then slowly but surely it goes back to zero. So it gives me really each individual points uh, and the distance between points and the all the values between these points, these lines essentially. So what if I use line tilde instead of line? The same thing is going to happen, but this is going to come out as an audio signal, which means it's perfect for multiplying with our phaser outputs. So multiply tilde by default, let's make it zero, right? So the default argument is zero, meaning that if this doesn't receive anything, it will be zero. But otherwise, if I click on this button now, I'm getting a sound. It still sounds like an overweight uh, mosquito, but it is a sound and it does have an envelope and uh, making sound is about 95% of making music. Now, it's all about making the sound cooler. Right, uh, and as a last note, I can kind of change these envelope points or just clear and redraw it if I want. So that might be something you can have fun with yourself if you want to. But all right, so how do we make the sound, well, better, sound nicer? Uh, well, a nice trick is to use a very basic filter. Uh, so I'm going to use one pole, which is a single pole low pass filter, which means that the low frequencies, uh, which I set uh, as an argument, are going to pass and the frequencies higher than the center frequency, let's make it 100, are going to be attenuated, meaning they are going to uh, not sound or uh, this <laughs> filter is going to do its best to make those uh, frequencies not sound. Which means we are going to get a warmer sound. We are going to hear the lower frequencies, uh, ones at 100 and uh, less, uh, and the higher ones are going to be less audible. So if the phaser goes to one pole and that gets applied by the envelope, we get... Okay, now this is a nicer, friendlier, warmer, overweight mosquito. And of course, uh, the final step is then to apply some nice reverb. Right, I'm going to go to my plugins here. Uh, for almost all my Max projects, I use Valhalla Supermassive. It's a free reverb, you can find it online. I'll try to put a link to it, uh, to the description of this live stream after it's done. Uh, but after you install it, after you restart Max, when you go to this plug here, when you go to this VST here, you should be able to see Valhalla Supermassive and you can drag it here. And since this is a VST object, well, it will receive these two uh, inlets, so audio input and audio input two, AKA or left and right inputs. So before I send this audio to live.gain, why don't I take this, put it here, put it here, and then the first two outlets are going to be the result. And let's see how it sounds now. Ah, oh, that's much nicer. We are reaching Brian Eno levels of cool ambient music bass. But you see what happens if I trigger the envelope too quickly? There is a click because uh, I'm kind of snapping it back to zero while it's in the middle of the envelope here. So I have to be careful with that. And let's click this wrench button and set a nice preset while we are at it. Uh, 
One of my favorites is Reverb's Large Triangulum Hole. But if I set this, I get this really nice chill reverb. Okay, so we kind of managed to play the sound. We can try variations of this for uh, the other layers of the music. Uh, but why don't we try to actually generate random notes now? Right, so I want to generate random notes and I am not going to use a random object. Right, Normally in my random music generation videos I always use a random object because it's pretty accessible, it's pretty easy to work with. But I want to do something a bit more fun and I want to use, let's see if I remember it I, right, I table, the data table editor. Yes, I do remember it right, fantastic. Okay, so again this looks like our uh, function object right there, but if I lock it, it is a kind of a table I can draw on this, right? And again, there are X and Y values here. So it's like every X value has a corresponding Y value, depending on what I draw. And the fun of this object, of this I table, is the fact that I can use it as a probability table. So let me, let me show you what I mean. First of all, I'm going to go to I and I'm going to change the table size, right? Because this is how many different values I want, how many steps I want to randomly trigger. Uh, so I want 12 steps, right? I want one for each chromatic note. I want, uh, all the, I want all the 12 notes between F and F because this is going to be the F major scale. So I can type in 12 here. You can see it's immediately 12 elements now. And then I can change the range of the table. So that's the Y axis, that's the vertical side of things. And I'm going to set this to 100. So it's, I will interpret this as a percentage chance of things happening. Right, so uh, now what happens if I set all of these guys to the max? So everything is 99. And I send a bank to this object and I visualize the contents, the output of the I table by using a message box, more specifically its second inlet. Well, getting random values, right? 2, 8, 9, 11, 6, 2, 4, 3, 6, 7, 1, 9, and so on and so on. So it just seems like random. But here's the thing, the value of each step here determines the chance that it's going to trigger. For example, if everything is at the bottom and I have uh, element number five all the way up. Now, if I send a bank, I'm always going to receive fives, right? Or I can have five and nine. And again, I'm just going to get 50% chance of five or nine. But what if I have a third element that's not all the way up, so the probability is somewhere in the middle, it's 50%. Right, so now if I keep sending these banks, uh, the chances are I'm going to receive uh, five or nine, but there's a smaller chance that I'm going to receive the value three. Right, and there is some math and logic involved in this, like if you, if you go to the help file, I believe, uh, let's see, provides visual display and uh, select a random value, bank outputs a random quantile message with a random number between O and 32.768 or 32,768 as an argument. Those are a lot of words. And if I see what the quantile message is, it's uh, this. The word quantile followed by a number multiplies the number by the sum of all the numbers in the I table object. This result is then divided by two to the power of 15, which is 32,000. 768 and then the table sends out the address at which the sum of all values up to that address is greater than or equal to the result. Now those are a lot of words I don't like such as quantile and numbers and sums and divisions and address and results. Well, some of those words I do like but the point is I, I don't want to worry about all of this mess and I just want to be able to say this is a probability table. If the if the slider is higher, the chances that you're going to get that specific value is higher. If everything's at the bottom, you're going to get zero all the time. Otherwise, you can kind of set the chances of your steps and then trigger those elements uh, at those chances on each bank, which is cool. All right, so I have 12 steps, so let's think about this. Now, of course, the first step is the first note in my 12 note sequence, right? And in this case, well, what is it? I can write it down. Uh, it's F, 
F sharp, G, G sharp, A, A sharp, B, C, C sharp, D, D sharp, E, and then, well, F, but that's the 13th element. That's the forbidden element that we do not talk about. Let me put that sharp here. So these are my 12 values here, right? They're not really evenly distributed. Maybe I can distribute it a bit better. So we have some nice visuals as I'm changing these values. It's like a nice user interface, isn't it? I can just set it up like this. And the F is not necessary. All right, so these are my chances. And well, I can maybe set the probability of what we call the tonic, the first degree, and all the scale notes to be fairly high. Right, and maybe I can give more weight or more chance to, let's say, the, the fifth, so the dominant and the subdominant, and the others can have lesser chances. And to make things interesting, I can give a very tiny chance to these other notes that are in the chromatic scale, but they don't really belong to F major, right? Like F sharp and G sharp and uh, B, B natural and C sharp and D sharp. I don't expect those notes, so maybe they can appear once in a while to make things interesting, right? And now if I bang this, uh, I can send this value to my M to F object, but, but because this is zero, well, it's going to be the lowest possible MIDI note, which is not what I want. I want zero to be F, right, 41, and then one becomes 42, uh, two becomes 43, and so on. So essentially, I want to take this value, and I want to add 41 to it. And whatever the result of that is, that's going to be my next note. And then I can use the same button to trigger the random note as well as the envelope. So I can just click this. And if I mash this, it's going to start clicking because I have not clear out the envelope. But you see what's happening here. I am getting unique notes that are based on the probabilities I set here, which I set it up uh, according to the F major scale. Okay, so this is partly done too. I, I have generated notes. Uh, well, I've generated bass actually, but I have also generated notes and I can use this to make a melody as well. It's all a matter of copying and pasting, isn't it? But how do I keep the time? So how do I click this? About uh, well, how do I not click this? And this happens automatically. A very standard way is, of course, using Metro. Right? I can uh, make this happen each second. Just connect this here. Use the toggle object, and then if I turn on the Metro, Which is nice, it is nice, but it does create the problem of dealing with subdivisions. Right? Because if I have this metro and then I say three times every, uh, three times per that metro bank play these random notes and every five times play these chords, it's not going to be very easy. And also it's not going to be as fun as using a phaser, uh, an audio signal to keep track of time. So let's do this. I, I did this in, I think, in my most recent video, uh, Generative Polyrhythms. I use a phaser and it visualizes output using live.scope, right? That uh, this ramp becomes my measure. And then I can also uh, think of this as one measure. Uh, let's see, so uh, I can use integer number box to set the measure length or the tempo in, in BPM and then I can divide this by 60 to get the corresponding frequency, for example, 50. All right, and now I want to get a bank every two measures. How do I do it? How do I keep track of the banks? How do I keep track of this whole thing. Uh, so I can turn these ramps into impulses, right? So I can use what? I was like saying the name of this object, it's like I'm saying what? But no, that's the name of the object. What? What is the object? I'm using what to generate impulses based on phasers. So now I'm getting one impulse, a single sample with a value of one 
every phaser ref. Which means I can keep track of this. I can keep track of the measures elapsed. Right, how, how can I do this? Well, I can use the plus equal tilde objects, which are three fantastic characters that mean signal accumulator. So this object is going to just add up all the values it receives into its uh, first inlet. And it's going to send out its output, its uh, current value from its outlet, which we can visualize with the number tilde object because it's an audio signal. And since I'm just receiving these impulses, right, every, uh, on every phaser, each time I receive a sample of one is added into the accumulator and it's kind of counting the bars elapsed in my ambient music generator. So then it becomes a bit easier to determine, uh, you know, if it has been two measures or two bars or not, I can simply use the modulo operator. So modulo two, oh, modulo tilde two, of course, we are still in the audio signal domain. And whoop, there we go. So now zero, one, zero, one, which means I can uh, get the value, uh, as in I can get this value as, uh, not as an audio signal, but an actual integer value. And I can see if it's zero, trigger this. If it's uh, one, trigger that. So I'm going to use snapshot, which is going to convert the signal values to numbers. So, and I need to give snapshot either an argument uh, in, you know, per uh, X amount of milliseconds, uh, it's going to get the value of the audio signal, or each time I send a bank to snapshot, it's going to convert the incoming audio signal into a value. And I want to do it like that because I already have a way of turning these impulses, my phaser ramps into banks, and that's called edge. Edge is going to detect logical signal transitions as in if the value goes from zero to one or zero to something else, it's going to send out a bank from its first outlet. So on every impulse, if I do it like this, I can receive a nice bank, which is uh, which is pretty useful, isn't it? So I can just take this bank and I can trigger all sorts of events just using this system. All right, uh, excuse me while I take care of something here. There we go. All right, so uh, I can use this bank. I can send it into snapshots. And now I'm just receiving this data, this audio data, as normal, good old max integer numbers. So I can just say, uh, select zero. So send out a bank if this incoming value is zero. And then what is going to happen? Well, I'm going to get, snapshot is going to send a zero every two bars. The zero is going to trigger a bank, which I can then send it to my random note generator. And now I'm just getting this very nice baseline that is ambient, that is generative, and it's based on probability tables, which is also really, really cool. Okay, but I think just using base is a bit boring. So I have technically done all of these things, but I only have base. So why don't we use this exact same system to generate melodies? Right, so let's turn off the audio context uh, in case I mess something up and let's just copy these. So what do I need? Well, I need an envelope yet again, right? This is going to be a shorter envelope because probably these melody notes are going to be less than one second long. And uh, I also need this iTable object, right? And I am going to use the same kind of uh, phaser setup here. So again, take these here as well. The output of the envelope goes to line. I multiply the phaser, my oscillator, with that envelope's uh, line value. And to determine the frequency, I use my probability table. I add it to my, let's say, base note value, whatever is the lowest note in my scale. And that drives the whole process. And then the result, I can just feed it into the same VST object. That's always a good. Uh, MSP trick, if you send multiple audio signals into the same object, they're automatically added up and put through the same process. So now both of these lines are going to go through this Valhalla Supermassive Reverb and they're going to end up in the same place. Okay, uh, let's see. So 
first of all, I want to deal with this timing here, right? Let me turn my audio context back on. So this phaser is ticking. And let's use subdiv. Let's divide this phaser so we have faster phasers for my melody generator, right? So let's say on each bar, I want to have a possibility of four notes. So subdiv tilde four. And the phaser goes into subdiv, and that subdiv gives me that phaser divided into that amount of smaller phasers. So I'm getting four ramps uh, in the time that takes my main, my master phaser to generate a single ramp. All right, then I can just use the same thing, right? I'm also going to copy all of this. So my subdiv also uh, turns these phasers into impulses. I don't think I need uh, to keep track of how many phasers have passed because I'm not going to generate a melody note every two beats or every three beats. No, for now, for now, I want a new note on every phaser ramp. So I'm going to get rid of this. I'm going to get rid of this. And then let's see, but then what? Well, I also don't need to do this, right? Yeah, I can just do it like this. So now what is going to generate a bank per subdivision? And I can just use that bank to generate my melody notes. And how did this work? Let's copy this here as well. Well, these are the, this is the probability table for my notes, right? And I'm going to keep it very similar, but uh, let's make the chance of accidental notes a bit higher. Maybe because this is a melody, I think I can get away with some more wacky notes uh, that are thrown into the mix. But again, this is something you can play around with and create a million gajillion variations if you want. And lastly, before I actually try to play this, I want to change this bass note because 41 is pretty low for a melody. Uh, right, this is the bass region here. And how about this note, which is 65. So let's start from this F instead. So I'm going to add 65, not 651. That is done very poorly. I'm going to add 65 to the result of my probability check. So it's going to start from 65 and it's going to go up to well, up to 11, uh, possibly. So it's going to uh, take place in the span of this octave from F to F and it's going to give more weight to the scale notes. But there, is, there will also be a chance that the notes uh, that don't belong in the F major scale, the accidentals, will work. All right. Uh, okay, I, I see in the chat someone asking if, the, if this will be archived. Yes, after this live stream, uh, you will be able to access it on the channel. Uh, if you are watching this as a recorded video, hello from the past. I hope everything is still going well for you and for the world. Uh, but also if you're watching this as a live stream, I think it is possible to just uh, scroll back to the beginning and then just watch it from the beginning as I am still live streaming. Okay, so back to more programming things. Uh, where was I? Yes, so I was going to generate these random values. Uh, so I have my bank, so I can just put this bank here. Uh, should I yet? Yes, I'm going to put this bank here, but if I do this now, I'm going to bet I'm going to get a lot of clicks. And let's hear those clicks. Hmm. I'm not getting anything because I'm not triggering the function. I'm not triggering the, uh, the envelope here. I made this cool envelope and it is not even applied to the audio signal. So what did I do before? I take the bang that triggers the random note and that also triggers the function object, right? Okay, now let's hear the clicks. Yeah, that's that, that's a lot of clicks and that is not my percussion track, that is not the uh, kind of sound I'm going for. Why is this happening? Well, this envelope is, if I remember it right, 1000 long, as in 1000 milliseconds long, right? So, uh, it's an envelope that takes one second to complete. And now I'm not perfect at timing. I'm not the best person at timing, but I'm going to guess that these ramps are quicker than one second. 
and that means these banks uh, you know happen more frequently than one second which means this envelope is triggered again and again and again while it's still at the middle which means that it constantly snaps back to zero from whatever value it's at and because it's not a smooth transition to that value guess what happens well it just produces a click because that's what audio signals do in the dig digital environment so i have to change this high domain display value x-axis of the function object Right, and let's make it, uh, let's see, this is one second divided by four. So that's 250. Right, and you can see the function kind of tries to just show me the first part of that graph, but I, it's better to just clear the entire function and uh, draw another envelope. Right, so start from zero. Let's do a classic a tacky envelope, so you know it's, uh, it sounds a bit percussive, but not clicky. Okay, so let's see how this sounds. All right. Though I, I do find this a bit too fast. Uh, at least the base changes a bit too fast. So what about instead of modulo two here, so every two bars, I do modulo four. So every four bars give me a new note. How would that sound? Okay, not bad. But now that I think of it, the melody is also quite fast, so maybe I can subdivide this into two instead of four. Right, so subdiv two would give me uh, two subdivisions of my main phaser instead of, instead of four subdivisions, which would make this much slower. And maybe a longer envelope here as well. And this really reminds me of uh, those that old Game Boy music. You know, if you played original Pokemon games, it always used to have these kinds of uh, these kinds of melodies in it. Uh, but what would make this even cooler is probability, right? So, for example, getting something every subdivision well it gives us this continuous line and it makes me think of uh, I don't know, like modular synthesizers and things like that but I can use the prop attribute or the prop message to subdiv and I can say for instance if I say prop 0 0.8 0 0.5 this would affect the chances of these subdivisions triggering the first one would have an 80% chance of happening and the second one would have a 50% chance of appearing here well, maybe it will make more sense when you see it. So if I send this prop message, there we go. So sometimes we are not getting any notes, right? So if I turn the audio back on, There does seem to be a problem though, isn't there? If if there is uh, a single, let's say, empty phaser, that's called uh, empty phasers, uh, we still hear something. And I know what this is because I have been thinking about this just yesterday. This is a problem of what? Normally what, by default, is supposed to give us, and I can right click here and go to trigger modes. Ah, by default, it gives us uh, impulses both on ascending uh, parts of phasers and descending parts of phasers, which means uh, if we don't give any arguments to what, then it's going to give us an impulse at the beginning and at the ending of a phaser. And normally you might think, ah, then I'm just going to change trigger mode to ascending. But then it does the exact same thing. Still, the descending ones generate an impulse. Now, this is a bug. This is not supposed to happen. And there are a few ways around this. But what I like to do 
is to multiply the result of what? The audio signal, so multiply tilde, with the subdiv itself. So just uh, do a bit of shuffling here. Hmm, and normally this would give me only the first part of the phaser. Uh, ah, I can do it like this. I'm going to use, let's see, does not equal zero. Does not equal tilde zero, and I'm going to put it here. There we go. And now if there's a pause, yes, there is no impulse. So what this does is it receives a subdivision and it goes through this uh, comparison operator, right? It says, is this value not zero? And if this value is indeed not zero, we get a one, as in yes. And if this value uh, is zero, then the answer to our question is no, so we get zero. Which means uh, when what does that faulty second impulse as the phaser is going down to zero, we multiply the result, that impulse, by one. Because since the phaser is at zero, it gives us a value of one here. This check says, is it not zero? No, it is zero. So it sends out zero and that impulse is multiplied by that. That might sound like a word salad to you, the point is that if you do this, it is going to work. And just knowing this is enough sometimes, right? Uh, but now I'm get, I'm using uh, probability to trigger my probability here. I'm using prob probability to see if I use probability to trigger my notes. And this should give me a bit more variety. Wow, it's really cool. And it's from pretty simple things too, right? It's just a phaser, it's just a sawtooth wave, a bit of uh, filtering, a bit of reverbing, a bit of random chance gives us these really cool, uh, really cool ambient musics. Uh, but now, let's see, so this is still partly done, right? I've generated notes, I've generated bass, but I have not generated chords. So maybe that is something I can do in this situation. I have played the sound, I am keeping the time. I hope I determined the aesthetic, at least a very basic ambient music aesthetic, but how do I generate some chords? So let's try and generate some chords. Uh, and normally I would consider using multi-channel objects to do this since I love the multi-channel objects, but I'm going to be a bit boring here and I'm just going to use three other phasers. Right, so I'm going to copy three other phasers. And these are going to be, let's see. Well, no, I'm, I'm going to have, no, I'm going to have three phasers. All right, so these are going to be the oscillators for my triad, right? And what I want to do is, based on chance, again, uh, if I generate a chord, I want to take this root note, whatever bass note I'm playing, and from that, I either want to make a major chord or a minor chord or a diminished chord. Uh, so I can calculate the required notes for that. I can put it through this phaser. I can again put it through this same envelope. In fact, since it's the same envelope, I don't need a second one, I think. I can again apply this filter. So one pole, 110. And then uh, I have to, again, multiply all of these. And I think I'm allowed to do this. I think I'm allowed to just pile on all these audio signals into one inlet and then put the line envelope in the second inlet. And I think I'm allowed to do this. And this will give me, you know, all three sounds within this envelope. So let's just try to get major chords first. So I'm going to bring up my trusty case slider here. All right, and uh, let's see, let's take this as a root note. So, so our base note would be this, and the root note of my triad should always be an octave higher, right? So this, from my probability check, 
plus 41, I get my root nodes. So I am going to add 12 to that, get something else. So now it's an octave higher. I'm going to use M2F to translate that MIDI uh, value into a frequency. And this is going to be my uh, root notes. All right. In fact, I think I can already hear it if I... Well, I have to also connect this here, of course. Yes. Nice. Okay, I, I think that's an octave higher. I'm not hundred percent sure it does sound like as an interval, but let's let's try it regardless. So what else did I, do I need for major, minor, and diminished chords? Well, I always have the same root note, right? I, I want that uh, note major. I, I want that note minor. I want that note diminished chords. So let's just write this down. So a major chord is root plus a major third plus a perfect fifth. And minor is root plus minor third plus perfect fifth. And diminished is root plus minor third plus diminished fifth, hence the name uh, diminished fifth chord. Uh, okay, so then I need to take the second part, right? So these two other oscillators are going to either be the major third and perfect fifth, or minor third and perfect fifth, or minor third and diminished fifth. This is going to create our chords. So why don't I use yet another I table for this so I can set the probabilities for each chord? Only I, I don't need a uh, I don't need twelve elements here. I I'm just juggling between three chords, so my table size in the inspector can be three. All right. So let's say major chord, minor chord, diminished chord. So again, I can send a bank, and this is going to give me either zero or one or two. Yep, zero or one or two. So let's select the results. So I'm going to use cell three. Wait, why am I using cell three? That's, that's the wrong argument, oh no. I need to use cell and then I need to give as arguments the selectors, the values this object is looking for, which is zero and one and two. And if they do match, so if one, zero or one or two comes into here, then uh, one of these outlets uh, corresponding to which if it's zero or one or two, is going to send out a bank. And I can use it. So let's say if it's zero, it's a major chord, so it's a major third and a perfect fifth, AKA it is major third is four semitones higher. So one, two, three, four, yes. And uh, five, six, seven, and the perfect fifth is seven semitones higher than my note, right? And then minor third would be three semitones plus seven semitones and diminished would be plus three semitones and plus six semitones. Okay, so I need to add these values to my root notes. So by default, I can make this major, right? So get my base note, add an octave to it, making it a root note, and then add four to it, making it a perfect, I mean a major third above that note. And similarly, plus seven is going to make the perfect fifth higher. Okay, so before we go into this random chance, let's see if we actually hear a major chord. Nice. It's very dark though, I, I, maybe you want that, but to me it sounds really dark, so I'm going to add 24 instead of 12 to the bass note, taking it up two octaves higher. Whoa, I did not want that to happen. Hmm, let's turn off reverb for now. Interesting, it doesn't really sound like a major chord, is it? And we also got that popping sound sound which is which is very 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 bad if you have a if you hear a big pop like that, which makes me happy. I'm using this uh, omx.peak lm here to uh, 
hopefully protect your ears. So what is the problem here? Ah, look at this. I forgot to use M2F here. I, I'm not turning these MIDI values into frequencies. So this phaser is going off at a frequency of seven or something. All right, so what if I do this? Yes, that sounds like a major chord. If I turn the reverb back on. Ah, now that's music to my ears. Beautiful. All right, uh, maybe instead of phasers, I can use a different oscillator for a different timbre of sound. For example, tri, so an anti-aliased triangular oscillator, uh, which should give us a softer sound with these chords. It's nice, isn't it? It's a very flutey sound, very woodwindy. Okay, and now we can also use our uh, different possibilities, right? So what did I say? If it's zero, it is a major chord. So plus four here, plus seven here. Let's uh, make some more space for all of this. There we go. So if it's zero, four and seven. This is the second inlet of these objects. I either put four, I put seven. There we go. So four and seven. Now, if it's the second outlet, so if I get one, I get a minor chord, which means plus three on the first on the first voice, and again plus seven on the second one. So I can do it like this. And then in the third case that I get a diminished chord, I am going to get a plus six in my second voice, so a diminished fifth interval, and the minor third, so in three semitones in my second voice. So it does look a bit spaghetti here, but I, I hope you're following along, uh, or at least you're understanding what is going on here, that I'm setting the intervals, uh, which I uh, add upon my root note in order to create certain chords. And of course, I can determine this with the uh, probability table here. So let's say a lot of major, uh, also a lot, but slightly less minor, and once in a while, some diminished chords. Right, let's use the same bank for this. And let's see if does, this does indeed sound good. Nice. Oh, this is beautiful. <clears throat> what is really nice, but is not intended, is the fact that sometimes I'm getting these two chords one after the other. I think this uh, snapshot, if it's receiving zero twice, it is sending out zero twice, so uh, I'm getting two triggers from the same chord, which is which is not something I want, uh, right? But it is a cool effect, so I would normally keep this in a personal project, but if I'm being incredibly pragmatic, I can use the change object, and I can put this to my uh, snapshot output, and uh, that goes eventually to my select to filter out repetitions, so filter out those zeros. Nice. And maybe uh, it would also be cool to have a different envelope for, for these chords, right? So I can indeed copy this and then I can have my own line for this function, for my chords here. And this line uh, can have a different envelope, right? Let's uh, clear this. So let's give it a very slow ramp. And again, the same bang that triggers all of the other guys also triggers this. 
which means we get something like this. I think this is nicer. And you know what would be what would be cool if uh, if these chords didn't trigger all the time, there would be a possibility that we would also get an empty bar. Right, uh, let's see, how can I do this? How can I do this, how can I do this? Um, let's use this side. <laughs> I have never used this side, even though I know it's an object. I know this side is an object. And I know functionally it's the same thing as random one, as in when you bang it, it either gives you a, a, a one or a zero, a key it lets you decide on something, essentially flipping a coin. So let's use this to decide if this uh, bank goes to the envelope, right? Meaning if this bank never arrives at the envelope, then what happens is that the envelope doesn't trigger, AKA even though we have selected a chord and we have set our oscillators to those specific frequencies, we don't hear it because the envelope has not been triggered. Okay, so I'm going to do it like this. The main button that also goes and triggers the envelope, I'm going to put an interim button here because I want to use this side and I want to use the trigger object, right? I'm going to say TBB short for trigger bang bang. And if I put it, put this here, now every time this uh, bang goes here, first it's going to send out a bang here it's going to do whatever this bang uh, you know, goes through and takes care of all that, and then it sends this second bang. And I can use this to create this prob probability gate. Right, and I can literally create a gate object. And let's say gate has one outlet. In this case, I just want the message to pass or not. And initially it's open. Now, every time this bang comes here, first this bang, the first bang goes to this side. And this banks, uh, this decide object sends out either zero or, or one. It's a coin flip. Uh, so it uh, will randomly generate zero or one. So it goes into gate here. The first inlet of gate will open or close the gate. Zero will close it, meaning that nothing will pass even though this second inlet receives messages. And one means it's open as in, yeah, gate's open. The, the message can pass through. So I decide this and then Again, a bit of a spaghetti situation here, but then this bang goes into the uh, the second inlet of gate. And if the gate's open, it will pass. If it's not, it won't. Meaning we get a 50-50 chance of this uh, chord triggering. No chord. Nice. Honestly, I can just kill, I can just leave this on and it can become one of those 24/7 uh, ambient music live stream. I I don't I don't know if there's already a 24/7 uh, Max MSP ambient music live stream, but uh, if you want, you can set this up and uh, be a YouTube star yourselves. But all right, so that's really cool, right? And it's uh, relatively simple, but uh, there are all these parameters you can change. Maybe you can randomly determine scales as well. Maybe you can add a rhythmical element to it. Maybe these probabilities can change over time based on other probabilities. So a lot of fun to be had here. Which means we did uh, do the first thing, right? That the ambient music generator is complete. I'm gonna put a lot of exclamation marks here because I'm really happy I created an ambient music generator using good old simple Max MSP objects. It is really nice. Okay, now the second part. Wow, it's, it's been exactly an hour. I did this in one hour. Let's see if the second part also takes an hour uh, or maybe a shorter or maybe even longer that this becomes one of those five hour live streams that I'm just debugging the patch and it's like crashing and it's horrible and I'm just uh, 
very sad I'm crying at the end, but I, I don't think that's going to happen. Okay, so ambient particles generator. Uh, let's put everything somewhere else, right? I want to keep this in the same patch, but let's just shift it over here so we have some empty space here for our visual patching adventures. Now, what do I want from ambient particles? What are the steps I need to do uh, to create uh, ambient particles? What are ambient particles even? I have no idea, but I'm going to create a visual idea using particles and I'm going to let uh, the audio process drive it. So first of all, I need to set up a particle system. Then apply visual idea. I will think of it when the time comes and uh, the make every note slash chord slash bass trigger a different visual event slash color. Let's also make them colorful. Cool. So this is what I want to do. And let's start with the easy one. So creating a particle system. Now, what do I need? I need the JIT GL environment, right? I need to create a JIT.world. Let's call this ambience. Uh, I'm going to, let's see, full scene. Anti-aliasing is one. Da -da -da -da. I can give it a size if I want, I guess. 300 to 300. Floating is very important. So floating one will make sure it's always on top of the screen. And I think that's it, right? So I have my little ambient window right here. Let's make it a bit bigger so it looks nice on the live stream as well. So if I toggle this on, I know I'll get the, uh, I'll get a bank per frame from the middle outlet. So I can just send it, so S Metro. So later I can receive these banks. Okay, so particles, uh, very simple. I need to use a JIT GL mesh. Uh, I need to, as an argument, give the name of my context, which is ambience. I need to use draw underscore mode points, and I'll just give it a color of one, 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 so white color. Uh, and I think this should be all right. Right now there isn't anything on the screen because I need to tell JIT GL mesh where to draw, where to draw these particles. So let's use a jitter matrix, jit.matrix, uh, three float 32. And let's see, I, I want to have a bunch of circles. I want like these pulsating particle circles that uh, appear each time there's a new event. Uh, so how am I going to do this? Da, 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 da. I'm going to create a 2D jitter matrix, which means uh, there are th three planes in my matrix, but it's going to be let's say uh, 1,000 by 12, no, 1,000 by 10, right? So it's going to be the width of the matrix is going to be 1,000, so there are going to be 1,000 elements, and the height of the matrix is going to be 10, so there are going to be 10 rows. Okay, so then I can put this through a JIT gen, so we're going into more cool stuff now. And then I can process the data so it kind of figures out the positions for a circle. Right? Uh, only I have to send this matrix each time through JITGen. So when I make uh, any kind of change in JITGen, this matrix goes through JITGen, it comes out to JITGL mesh, and I can actually see what's going on. So let's see, receive metro. So now these banks are going to send metro, receive metro. Okay, now, uh, well, JITGen is, as you might know, is essentially like Max, it's only cooler and a bit more intimidating. Uh, so I'm in my JITGen here and I'm going to get the normalized coordinates, right? So I can even try to visualize it like this. Ah, look at this here, I'm already getting my particles on the right, top right side of the screen. So now each cell is going to return a value if we are using this norm operator or object. Uh, it's going to get a value between 0 and 1, right? And because this is a 2D jitter matrix, there are actually two values here. I can Swiss X and Swiss Y. And now each particle's X and Y values will be different because uh, it's 1,000 to 1. If I'm at, let's say, matrix that is at the coordinate of 500 on X, uh, on the X axis, and 2 on the Y axis, it's going to have 0.1 as its x normalized coordinate value. It's going to be exactly between 0 and 1. But on the y-axis, it's barely moves. Uh, it went from 0 
to 2, so it would be 0 0.2 on the y-axis. So this might be useful later. Uh, now what I want to do, I want to draw a circle, so that means I can use uh, polar coordinates, right? Polar coordinates are always cool, so I can use pull to car. And I can define a polar radius and a polar angle, and then those will become Cartesian coordinates, which I can pack into a vector, so x and y coordinates, and then just send them out here. Okay, so what if the radius is determined by the y uh, normalized coordinates, right? So norm, so is y, and like this. Okay, there are already some tiny points here. Let's make these dots bigger so it actually looks like something. Uh, so I'm going to give JGL mesh the attribute point underscore size. How about five? Okay, maybe, maybe this looks a bit, bit, a bit better in the live stream. Anyway, then I need my polar radius, right? Uh, polar ra uh, polar, sorry, polar angle, which means uh, how much it rotates from this point, and this is measured in radians, so it goes between zero and two pi. Now my norm goes from zero to one, so if I multiply it by two pi, it will go from zero to two pi, right? And this is something you can only do in JetGen times two pi. This will not work in regular max. If I go here and type times 2 pi, oh, there, there, there is something happening. But will this actually multiply the value of 2 pi? No, it, it will not. The 2 pi will not be understood as a certain value. It will just be, it's the same as typing times tomato. And it will also say, what, what are you talking about? But JitGen knows what's going on, it knows that this multiplied by 2 pi gives us this. And look at this, we have a nice spiral here. Isn't this cool? All right, so we have these spirals. So, so we, have, we have a particle system and we do have a visual idea. So maybe we can move this spiral, right? Uh, so I can actually say that I have created a particle system and I am kind of <laughs> applying a visual idea here. Okay, so how do we move this? Uh, so what if I give an offset to each of these spirals, right? Uh, to the radius of these spirals, so how far these particles are away from the center. So I'm going to declare a parameter, uh, and sorry if I'm going too fast over these, but I'm assuming uh, if you're watching this, you kind of know what, uh, how the, you kind of know how the JITGen environment works. If you, if you don't, I do have a lot of videos where I use JITGen and I go a bit more into detail of things. In any case, hopefully it's entertaining to watch. So I'm going to declare a parameter uh, called, let's say, time, right? Uh, and that means if I have a parameter declared in JITGen, I can send it the message time and then a value. So I'm going to put dollar sign one here. So it's whatever floating point number I sent here. And then I can use this to offsets the polar radius of every particle. Right, so I can use the plus operator, and I can say to this radius, add, let's make it look a bit, a bit more nice, a bit more alluring, a bit more attractive, param time. Okay, so now if I change this value here, Look at this, I have this really cool pattern. Whoa, it, it does look really cool if I am crossing the zero point. So it's, it's like they're going into each other. This is a really cool visual effect. Okay, so, okay, I'm, 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 I'm having way too much fun with this. And then it will infinitely go away. But I can also use the modulo operator, right? Uh, to kind of give it a maximum limit. What do I mean by this? If, the, let's say, I want to say, if your radius is larger than one, then just wrap it back to zero and start again. And I don't even have to use modulator. Let's be cooler and use the wrap object, right? Which is going to wrap the input to a range within a low and high, uh, high output value, which means I can simply say wrap zero, one. And now if this value ever goes above one, it is just going to wrap back around to zero. Which means when I keep adding this time, look at this, this uh, circle will keep 
appearing. In fact, I can automate this, right? I can use jit.time, and if I have a jit world running, this jit time is going to continuously give me uh, these increments. Whoa, which is really fast. Uh, it's a bit annoying. So let's use the speed attributes and lower the speed to what it's normally one, which is normal speed, and let's have 0.1. So there we go. So we have this nice particle spiral going out. Right, okay. Uh, but now, I want this offset to happen, and I want this these uh, spiral edges, these circles to loop back around to one only if there is a node plague. So how do I do this? Hmm. <laughs> okay, well, I, I did apply the visual ID here, so that's not an issue. But how do I make every node uh, yada, 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 trigger a different visual event color? So, okay, let's try to break this down. So I let's say I have a button, right? And triggering this button will make one of these circles appear from uh, the zero points. Uh, so, how about I create yet another parameter that says circle? Right, and then I want to see if, uh, hmm, if that circle value uh, corresponds to, let's say, we give an index number to all of these circles. If it corresponds to that, then set all the particles that belong to that index, uh, so that uh, particles belonging that to that circle to the zero points. Hmm. How do I do that? How do I do that? Let's see. So I can use the cell object so, or the cell operator to get the coordinates of my input matrix, right? And if I use Swiss Y, I get my Y coordinates. So every particle in the first circle is going to have zero as their Y coordinates. And then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It's going to go from zero to three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, so this is, then I want to check if this uh, equals to my circle parameter, right? So does this equal? And then if the, my circle selection does fit uh, the y coordinate of the particles, then I can do something. Okay, then I can use the ternary operator. Again, this is an object that will only work in the JIT gen environment, a question mark. So the first inlet is a condition to test, the question I'm asking. And then I can say, if that is true, let uh, the values coming in here through. Otherwise, let these other values coming he into here through. All right, then what do I want to do? So if this is true, if the coordinate of my cell is zero, I mean, the y coordinate of my cell uh, matches this parameter, then pass, uh, then give me a value of zero for my polar radius. So if this is true, give me a. Otherwise, if this is not true, just uh, give me the regular, you know, whatever value I need, whatever value I already have for my radius. Okay, so this does still create this visual uh, so that might, uh, that's, that's already, uh, that already means we are doing all right. So let's create the message circle dollar sign one. Okay, two, three. Okay, okay, this is working. So we, we are getting somewhere. So look at this. Now these circles are disappearing. They're actually not disappearing, right? They're all being relocated to uh, this dot here. Uh, because they are all at the zero position now. Right? So if I give this uh, circle one, the first circle, so all the uh, jitter matrix cells with the Y coordinate of one, 
are being replaced to the zero position. They have a radius of zero now. So they're all the way in the middle. Okay. But I don't want this, right? Because then they're all just in the middle, which is nice. It, it does create this nice uh, spiral visual. But I also want to check if they have passed the threshold. Okay, so I want to make it that they are at zero, but they can continue uh, to expand outwards afterwards. They don't have to stay in zero forever. Uh, so how can I do this? Well, why don't I do a double check? So I'm checking this, but I also want to check if the cell's y-coordinate equals circle and if the radius of that uh, circle is already above the thresholds, then bring it to zero. And then, because it will be zero, will not be, no, that doesn't work either. Oh my God, it's getting too complicated. Okay, you know what we are going to do? We are going to do something slightly more advanced because by trying to not make this advanced, I'm actually making this really complicated. So now we are going to use uh, feedback. We are going to use particle feedback. So instead of using time and param, whatever, let's do this. Right? We are getting the normalized coordinates and we are go using these to set up all of these pretty circles. That's it. I'm going to get rid of this metro. I'm going to get rid of these guys. And now do uh, the results of this JIT matrix is going to be fed back to itself. What does that mean? Let me first give a name to this jitter matrix. Right, so JIT matrix, the first argument will be, I don't know, uh, particles, very creative name. Now, if I create another jitter matrix, so JIT.matrix particles, these two are the exact same matrix. If I put something in one matrix, the other matrix will have that as well. If I change something in one of these matrices, the other one will be affected as well because they have the same name. They refer to the same thing, the same piece of memory inside the computer. So then I can do this, right? I can have recursion. So I can calculate my things, which goes through JITGen, which goes through these particles. But now this should also create a problem. Hmm, no, it's not creating a problem. But to apply feedback, I also need to have the x and y coordinates of these circles already calculated. So let's do it like this. Empty jitter matrix. Jit.gen gives me the x and y positions to these particles that lets me create this spiral slice circles. I load the result of this to a jitter matrix called particles. Then I do feedback. So I create another Jit.gen which processes these, which manipulates these X and Y values, and then feeds the result back to the same matrix. And because this is a pipeline, this is not going to create infinite recursion. Okay, so matrix loaded to JITGen, loaded to JIT matrix particles containing the X and Y coordinates of, the, of all these guys, and then uh, do something with JITGen and then use JIT matrix particles again to reset the values of my particles matrix to that value and then finally send it to JIT GL mesh. Huh. That's a lot of steps. Okay, I, I, I hope it is not incredibly complicated, but it is something. Now, what I want to do in my second JIT gen, the one that does the processing, I want to add a fixed amount, let's call it the velocity, to the radius of these circles. So they keep expanding and I want these guys to wrap around if they go over the threshold. So what we have done before, right? So because the incoming X and Y coordinates are Cartesian, I'm going to do cart to pole. So Cartesian to polar coordinates. And then I'm gonna do some magic there Then I'm going to use pole to car. So convert it back to Cartesian coordinates, pack it again, back zero, zero, zero. Like this. Okay. And here in the middle, uh, I'm going to take the first outlet, so the radius, the distance, 
and each time I'm going to add 0 0.001, so a very tiny amount to this distance. Because there is feedback involved, this is going to accumulate. Each time this matrix goes through, this jet gen is going to add this amount. And the angle stays the same. And if I do this now, I can set my matrix. Well, what is happening? This is not supposed to be happening. What is this uh, right here? Hmm might be that this cardopol is a bit faulty because what comes in is yeah this cardopol needs the x and y coordinate i'm i'm sending it the x y and z coordinates to each inlet so what i need to do is to use swiss x x coordinate and swiss y for the y coordinates and this there we go should work now, if I send a bank to my particle shooter matrix, it's a bit slow, but maybe you can see what's going on. The radius is increasing. And I can automate this by using R metro. And now these circles are just expanding forever and ever and ever and ever. All right, now going back to my the jit gen number two, I can also add a wrap function, right? So I can say wrap zero one. Just like what I did before, if it's over one, just go back to the beginning. There we go. So this is functionally the same thing, but it's using recursion. But because it's like this, I should be able to set a circle back to the zero position only if it fulfills a certain condition. So let's go back here. Let's get rid of this wrap so it's just expands forever and ever. And let's use the parameter uh, circle. Okay, so uh, what do I want to do? Again, I want to use the question mark, the ternary operator, and I want to say, once again, does the cell, so the cell coordinates, or more specifically, the Y coordinate of the cell, equal, the question mark, question mark, equal to my circle, right? Does it equal to my circle? Now, if it does equal, and uh, if it does equal, set this guy's position to zero, but then it's just going to be stuck at zero like before. So let's add another check. If it is like that, and if uh, it has not gone over the boundary, hmm. maybe not, maybe, if it is there and hmm. okay let, let's indeed do it like that if it is like that and if the radius of my uh, circle is greater than one Right? And a very good way of having AND statements is just to multiply the result of these questions. Why? Because these return 0 or 1. So if either one is 0, we are going to get 0. If both are 1, we are going to get 1. Very simple. Right. So this essentially means if the Y coordinate is the same uh, as a circle number, and if the radius of my circle is larger than 1, then set it to 0. So set my radius to zero. But otherwise, if that is not the case, I want you to get uh, my current radius and I want you to add 0.001 to that, to that, send it out. Okay, so what happens if I do this? All right, now all the circles are going out, but what if I give it, send it the message circle dollar sign one and then I say I don't know three then this third one well, one of them is reappearing four why are all of them appearing like this this is really strange right this does create a strange visual effect but okay there, there does seem to be a problem with the hmm the angle of these guys. 
<laughs> All right, I, I do have to think about this. So when I initiate this, there is no problem, except these two ones for some reason. But then when they are reset, the value it gets is like this, and the angle is uh, different as well. Now, why is that? What causes it to have a radius like this? I don't know. Maybe I would need to try something else. Okay, I'm going to take this to a really basic level, and some other time I will uh, try to focus on this. Let's go to the feedback, uh, no checking circles, wrap, zero, one. Kind of spirals we like. There we go. Now what I want is, I want this wrap to happen only if there is a sound triggered. Right, so I want to have some kind of toggle here. And if this toggle is on, this wrap around happens. If this toggle is off, the wrap around does not happen. Uh, and I think this will be easier to implement. So I'm going to say param toggle. Uh, and then I'm going to use question to see, say, is toggle zero or one? And since toggle is going to be zero or one, I can just uh, use this. And then I can, I can say if toggle is zero, so that's the, if the value of false, if it is zero, then just let these guys through. Right? But if the toggle is one, then do indeed do the wrap zero one. I say prepend toggle here. Is this going to create a cool visual effect? Hmm. This also in invalid message toggle. Aha. So we do have the problem of the message because this toggle has a capital T and this toggle does not have a capital T. So if I do this, there we go. It's off, it's back on, it's off, it's back on, it's off, it's on, it's back, it's off, it's on. Okay, so it is a visual effect. Is it beautiful? Not really, but I can maybe make it a bit more beautiful by adding colors. Let's, uh, let's do that. So I can take this very unsightly algorithm I have here. Maybe I can make this look a bit nicer while I'm at it. Uh, there we go. And I can have a second outlet that is going to be the colors. Right, and let's say I am you going to use the Y coordinates of these cells. And I'm going to treat this as the HSL color space. So this Y coordinate is going to determine the hue so I can scale 0 to 10 to 0 to 1. And this can be a part of a vector that is uh, that value, something between 0 and 1, representing the hue, and 0.1 for brightness, 0.5 for saturation. And then I can use the HSL to RGB to take this vector and convert it to the RGB color space, which JITGL uh, mesh will expect in its fourth inlet. And this will just give us these nice colors. Look at this. So we are going through the rainbow uh, in this manner. Hmm. Okay, so now toggling this does reset the rainbows outside to inside. All right. Uh, okay. Well, we are actually making progress. It was a bit annoying at some point, but uh, now it's a bit better. So now I want to get a bank per melody note. I'm going back to my ambient music generator here now, right? And I'm going to get this bang I receive on every melody note. Let's use send uh, melody bank. And then I can, again, put this away. And I can just use receive melody bank. 
Okay, now these are both, this, this is just a bank. So how do I make this uh, into a message that says, turn this on and then turn it off after 100 milliseconds? Well, I can use the delay object. Not delay tilde, I'm not actually using the delay audio effect. Delay proper, delay a bank. I'm going to delay a bank. Right, I can give as an argument, I believe, uh, milliseconds. Let me check the help file to make sure initial delay time. This can be time in milliseconds. Okay, so let's see, let's say every, no, not every 200 milliseconds, delay this bank for 200 milliseconds. So look at this. Bang, 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 200 milliseconds later. And if these both go into the same source, these guys trigger the toggle. Turn it on and off again, on and off again. All right, so if I turn the audio back on, that should... All right, it's kind of coinciding with the spirals. It's, it can be made better. I'm sure you watching uh, can make a way better version of this, but at least it fits somewhat with uh, the generation of the ambient music. Now, to make this look cooler, maybe we can offset each particle by a certain amount uh, that we set by using uh, JIT BFG. Again, I'm not going to explain this in super detail, uh, so I'm just going to create a random uh, noise function that is, uh, let's say, one plane, because this is going to offset only the radius of each particle. But the data type is the same, float 32. The radius is 10. All right, uh, it's going to be, should it be 10 or should it be something else? Let me think. Uh, it should be, okay, let's, let, let's make it like 1000 to 10 to two, we are adding a third dimension to our matrix. That's the only difference between these guys because we will need the third dimension when we are giving an offset to this guy on the third dimension. So offset zero, zero dollar sign one comma bank is going to offset this noise function. And as a basis, we can give it noise.simplex. Right, we can visualize the results by using jit.p window There we go, and now if I give it this offset, it's constantly changing, but it's changing in a noise pattern, so it looks actually pretty cool. So let's plug this into our uh, JIT gen. What I'm going to use, let's say, into, so a second inlet that is going to receive this matrix. And I am going to add whatever value is on here to my radius so no matter what i get for radius either the wrapped around version or the regular version i always want to add whatever is coming through the second inlet whoa okay this is not what i expect okay so something is happening right so we are getting crazy visuals here which might be nice which might be uh, cool if this is what you're into but this is a bit too much for me. And I think one of the reasons is because this random noise goes from minus one to one, which is giving a crazy offset to all of these particles. So maybe after I receive in two, I can use scale minus one to one to 0 0.01 and 0 0.05. Okay, this is still incredibly crazy. How about 0 0.001 and 0 0.005. Okay, it's slightly better. Maybe I can just reset the whole thing. There we go. Okay, I did not expect the visuals to be this crazy, but this is actually this is actually interesting. Maybe I can also play around with this JIT BFG's uh, scale attribute. So I can say scale dollar sign one bank. can give it like this different larger scale and look what happens if the scale is larger then this noise seems like a big explosion 
really it's really interesting. I I really do find it fascinating how uh, how crazy this became. Much 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 more strange than my expectations. There we go. Okay. I think this is happening because this is a cumulative, right? So when we change the radius, we uh, apply this each time. Hmm. And that is not something that I want. I don't want to add this on each iteration. So 60 times per second, we are adding this offset, which does create this cool visual, I'm not going to lie. But I just want to end this to end product after we have done the accumulation. Which, unfortunately, might mean that we have to do yet again another uh, Jitja. Sure, why not? We, we came this far. What is stopping us from a final Jitja? So Jitja that takes the result of these particles, right? So, and it also uses <clears throat> Cartopol. And just like before, it's going to do Swiss X, Swiss Y, and then pull the car after whatever process I'm going to do there. And the result is going to be a 3D vector out one. And then I'm going to have my second inlet here, second input here. This is going to be the random noise I add to these guys. And that is always going to be applied to the radius. So whatever the radius is, just add some noise to it. Okay. And we put this here. Maybe lower the scale a bit. There we go. Okay. And now because this noise is allotted, again, it goes from minus one to one, I can scale this minus one to one to 0.01 to 0.05. Yes, there we go. Now, now it looks uh, actually serviceable. And I can change this. All these parameters of, of my GLBFG. Nice, 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 really nice. Okay, and I can also try this, jit.matrix, three, float 32, 1000 to 10. Will this make a difference? Not really, but it's good to kind of make this guy fit into the matrix uh, type that we are using. Okay, so now we have cooler spirals, we have cool, Offsetty spirals, which is which is pretty nice. Maybe we can also change this on the y and z axis. So scale dollar sign one dollar sign one dollar sign one bank. There we go. It's more random noisy, and because the points are this huge, these look like lines. But we can ramp the point size down back to one. Maybe that's too small. How about two? Two. All right. So now they do look like points. And uh, this seems to... Kind of go with the music. Maybe instead of the melody bang, we can use the bang from the bass notes. There we go. All right, so we do have ambient particles and let's animate these particles too. Let's automate this offset by using the jit.time trick we just saw before. Maybe change its speed attribute to 0.5. There are some nice evolving particles.
Maybe to clear this out faster, I can go to my main jet gen. I can increase this offset I add to the radius on each time. There you go. And now it's clearing out on each instance. And there we go, we do have our ambient uh, music generator and also ambient visual generator. Done. Of course, this is not everything, right? So uh, I don't really have all of these circles individually interacting with the music or the colors individually changing with each melody note. So these are things I can do further by myself if I have another few hours and if I actually uh, think a bit more about what kind of algorithm I want to implement. But this is a very basic version of a nice uh, ambient melody slash visual generator with a lot of different sections you can use to take to further levels, such as, uh, as I said before, you can use the random chances here, the envelopes, these could change in real time, or you can uh, go into the visuals here and you can revamp these visuals. If you are good with Jit Chen, you can go in here and maybe turn this uh, offset, this velocity into its own parameter or do other things with its colors. Make it use a color palette instead of random values. I don't know. But uh, in any case, uh, I think this is a pretty cool starting point for uh, ambient visuals and ambient music. Uh, and it's also been, I think, about two hours <laughs> since I began. So uh, it has been a lot of patching I have done myself. So I think I'm going to sit down and have a nice coffee now. And I'm going to leave you uh, with this recording of this live stream. So to everyone that's watching live, uh, thank you for watching it live. That's uh, You are the reason I do this live. And everyone watching this afterwards, uh, thank you so much for watching. I hope this has been fun and interesting and inspiring for you. Enjoy your day.